Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is 3 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, and it is April 14, year 2022. As promised, I am going to be turning myself over to one Robin McLaurin Williams. I've been living with him closely over the past several days, reading his biographies, reviewing the notes, and today I will present to you the history from the grave of one Robin McLaurin Williams. So Robin Williams, please take it away. Nanu, nanu. <laughs> Well, it all started uh, to go downhill when I moved back over to uh, Marin County. You might have heard about it. It sits across the uh, San Francisco Bay. And as you'll hear very soon, I cut my teeth on stand-up comedy in uh, the city of uh, brotherly love. People say that's Philadelphia. and it, In truth, it's... Um, San Francisco, gay brotherly love, of course. So that's Marin County. That's uh, from a a, a site that uh, me and the missus used to go up and um, uh, ponder. I got into bicycling uh, in my later years. I, Before I died, I had eight, 80 uh, top of the line, some of them custom made uh, trail bikes and racing bicycles. So you could say that I was a uh, bicyclist or bisexual cyclist for uh, the latter part of my life. And here is where it ended for me. It's called Paradise K, C-A-Y. And for the nitpickers, sometimes it's pronounced key, but we locals down in Tiburon, this is um, a enclave. There's only about 200 homes like this. And that one with the white ro uh, red roof with the swimming pool. It's not really a swimming pool. It's a reflection pool. That's mine, and it overlooks the uh, beautiful San Francisco Bay. It's about 23, 23 feet above sea level, and if uh, the big tsunami ever hits, it's going to be underwater, tons of water. And um, I have a lot of interesting neighbors, um, and uh, the neighborhood where, you're, where you come up, especially in my case, uh, has been determinate in my life, as I'll mention to you. I'll review my my uh, attic years, as I like to call it, Attica, Attica. No, not Al Pacino, not not the movie Attica, but Attica, as in the case of V.C. Andrews. Yes, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, Robin McLaurin Williams did have a very much of a gothic childhood, very similar to V.C. Andrews. And I, Robin Williams, will encourage you to go back to Professor Hamamoto's playlist and look at his um, talks that are very much relevant and articulate nicely with uh, with my life and, and how it went down and how it ended and how I was resurrected from the dead in order to put forth an even greater, a more nefarious agenda. I was already slotted into the Hollywood scene in order to help pave the way for the friendly space brother alien invasion psyops that we're seeing here 2022. The Pentagon people who were working with Gary Marshall, who is the producer of Laverne and Shirley and Mork and Mindy and all those other great sitcoms of the um, through the 70s and through the 80s. And uh, my friend here, I like to view him as my medium, his Professor Hamamoto. I've read his book. It's published in 1989. It's called Nervous Laughter. He's an expert on situation comedies. So this is one of the, another reason why I decided to use him as the medium to communicate to you here in 2022 so that we can avert disaster. So yes, to finish up that thought, uh, that thought about Mork and Mindy, I was transported into an already successful show called Happy Days. Do you remember those? Um, yeah, I, I don't think I ever watched a, a single one of them, but uh, myself, because I was in it starting season two. And I came, it was called uh, Mork from Orkin, something of, to, of that uh, nature. I can't really remember, because remember towards the latter part of my career, I got Alzheimer's. And I guess that's... Um, 
God's way of uh, telling you that you don't w need to watch your old reruns or revisit uh, the really crappy movies that didn't do well at the box office. Uh, just like uh, cocaine, as I used to say, is God's way of telling you that uh, you're making far too much money. So that's Paradise KY. I wound up with the missus. Her name is uh, Susan Will Schneider Williams. And I'll tell you the cute meat. That's uh, movie talk, by the way, when boy meets girl, right? When Harry met Sally in the romantic comedies, there's always a setup. It's called the cute meat. But me and the missus, uh, Susan Williams, uh, Schneider Williams, we had a cute meet at the local. Remember when there were retail stores not that long ago? Well, we met. I guess we're at the Apple store. <laughs> Talk about cute meats. Is that a setup or what? We'll, I'll expand on what I mean by setup in a moment, ladies and gentlemen. By the way, I, I you know, in my haste to get into my shtick here, I, I just didn't um, take the time to thank you for being here in the, in the live chat here. And I really appreciate your help. Um, you know, Professor Hamamoto certainly doesn't make $160,000 an episode as I was when, um, I was, um, uh, slotted in, contracted. The show, show flopped. It was terrible. I had already lost my edge by that time. My mind was shot. Every, everybody knew it was going to be a dog, but I think the, uh, planners knew that because they wanted to leave me in sort of a pathetic, sad, abject situation so that I could be buried and then be resurrected for the next stage of a uh, human, post-human transgenic uh, engineering. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. But I was making $166,000 an episode on uh, the, um, I think it was called the crazy ones. Now, how is that for putting your finger on what was going to be happening in the future? As uh, the great writer Michael A. Hoffman II called it, he calls it revelation of the method. And that was the last big time network situation comedy. That was going to be my big comeback before it was yanked away from me purposely, of course. It was called Failing Forward. So that's the home there. Now it's today in 2022. It's in the possession of uh, Mrs. Uh, Schneider Williams. By the way, we were only married for three years, and um, shortly after my death in 2014, there was an acrimonious battle between my two former wives. By the way, that's one of the reasons why I took this really crappy job with the crazy one sitcoms that I knew that was, at least I'd get a couple of paydays, a few paydays that would help support this incredible home. Uh, right on the shore of uh, the San Francisco Bay in beautiful Paradise K or Q, if you want to be ped pedantic about it. Um, yeah, we were married for three years, and uh, we'll get into the settlement later and how uh, Ms. Schneider, my widow, Widow Williams, as she was once portrayed in the uh, newspapers, how she might, uh, in the end, wind up with much more money than any of his pre my previous two wives, <laughs> or <laughs> I tend to stand outside of, my, since I'm dead, I'm speaking from the great beyond. I tend to look at myself as an object, as if it's not really my life, and it really isn't, because I'm in a different uh, dimension now, and it's far beyond orc. So forgive me if, if I, I seem to be you know, slipping out of character. Um. This, ladies and gentlemen, uh, circa 1977 is the famed Golden Gate Bridge. And I think this is heading north. If those of you who have not been to the beautiful city of San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge connects the city, San Francisco, with the northern uh, county, such as Marin, where I wound up. Paradise K, or Q for the nitpickers, is part of Marin County. It's a it's a wealthy, it's an affluent community. And as we will get to momentarily, it's uh, Spookville. <laughs> there are a lot of people there who made their nut working further south in the Silicon Valley. This is an extension of Silicon Valley. It's miles and miles away, but the people that made tons of money down in Silicon Valley, a lot of them have squirreled it away in Paradise K. I was surrounded by them. And uh, I'm telling you this is because these people entered my life 
at a very early stage in my life when I was living in the affluent suburbs of Detroit City, Motown. Yes, indeed, Motown. Uh, as many of you already know, but I'll go through it again. My father was a Ford Motor Company executive. He was a high level executive. I had an affluent childhood. It was a lonely one. It was like flowers in the attic, except I didn't have a, even a sister to commit incest with. And I didn't have two stunted children, uh, siblings with me. It was just me, Robin McLaurin Williams, lost in the attic by myself doing these role plays. Now, every once in a while, there would be strange friends of my father coming up to the attic, and he would be wearing like a Baphomet's head, or sometimes my parents would take me to these late-night revelries amongst the other Ford Motor Company executives, and they'd trot me out, and it's really kind of strange because they were all wearing Venetian masks, and they were stark naked, right? So early on, I got that imprinting. And I was used to being passed around and handled and, uh, well, you know the rest of the story. And uh, as we'll get into Mork and Mindy, that type of behavior continued even through the 70s. Poor Pam Dauber. I groped her relentlessly. Every chance I had, I would grab her buttocks or her breasts and she would say, Robin, Robin, what are you doing? Uh, but as she says now, she forgives him. It was the 70s, and he's, you know, he's dead. And she, I would even take my clothes off. I would take my, I would be stark ass naked, except for the pelt that covered my entire body. As you know, if you look in the dictionary under her suit, you will see my picture there, Robin McLaurin Williams. I mean, I was so hairy. Even in the first movie that I thought I was going to break through to feature films directed by what Robert Altman? That was a really poor choice. Talk about casting choice. I mean, he did Nashville. He did all these really uh, kind of spacey movies, and he was hired to to cast uh, or to direct Popeye. But for the Popeye, I'm so hairy. They made me shave my forearms for the Popeye role. You know, uh, had I lived long enough, I would have put in my will that they should just. Just take me to a taxidermist and use me as a throw rug at, at the old Paradise K home. I was that hairy. Anyway, this is Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, I'll move on to the next graphic in a moment. Excuse me, but you know my routine. Ever since the beginning, I was always involved in word salad, stream of consciousness, and people would always marvel us at the incredible rate at which my synapses would fire. Right. We'd have these improv shows down even in high school. This is when I had aged out of being passed around, because you see in the, the pedophile circles, after you reach puberty, they get rid of you. They, they send you away or they kill you. They bury you. And in our case, my dad was moved out of the uh, affluent suburbs of Detroit. He was moved out of town and, and uh, the family moved all the way to Tiburon, which is Marin County, which is where I wound up where was my final handers, handler, Susan Schneider, came in, married me, and uh, oversaw my uh, mental faculties going to the dumpsters as everybody was uh, was uh, positioning self, my, their selves to take my image, my my holdings, my what little savings I had left. I was married three times after I was a celebrity. I'm Robin Williams, and uh, I could have all the, the drugs and indulgence I ever wanted, including 80... Uh, racing bikes, as I've already mentioned. So once you are passed around the circle, right, the people with the Venetian mask and their stark ass naked. By the way, I, I forgot to mention my my observation about my memory of one of the one of the filmings on uh, Mork and Mindy. Uh, but uh, just to embarrass poor Pam Dauber, I apologize to her for beyond the grave. I would strip down myself stark naked while she was trying to do her lines. <laughs> It's all funny now. It's all a joke, but I apologize. I mean, today I, I would be one of the targets of the Me Too movement, right? But uh, that w we're talking about 1978, 79. So here's the Golden Gate Bridge, Marin County, just on the other side. And um, it's it's Spookville, intelligence people, uh, Silicon Valley, people from the wine country, which I'll get into in a moment. 
That's why in California, this is why you you hear people, civilians uh, in the country, I'm sure you're sick of it, or people around the world look at California as some sort of uh, special place, and it is because it's Spookville Central, and it's really the cutting edge of all the different post-war technologies that have been planned out decades ago. And I, Robin McLaurin Williams, is here as a voice of Christmas past to warn you that I was sacrificed in order to take us to this next step in the post-human evolutionary phase, as most of you know here, was planned many, many decades ago by the elite bloodlines, uh, the Anglo-American bloodlines, which my father and my mother was part of. Let me just describe a little bit to you about my childhood. My father, even without a college degree, managed to ascend the heights of the Ford Motor Company hierarchy. And for those of you who are younger and don't realize what the automobile industry once represented in American society and in our economic system, I can't really fully communicate to you how much of a privileged position that my father was in. But he was a combat veteran. He was a World War II veteran. He saw everything. He saw bodies disconnected from their heads. He saw brutality, cannibalism, bloodletting on a massive scale. And that was just on the American side. And he was fighting the Japanese in the Pacific, just like my, my comedic mentor, right? Jonathan Winters, right? He's the only other guy who's at the same level as me. Jonathan Winters, we're the only two, right? He would have flashbacks about him, of the uh, the Jap snipers in Okinawa firing them. And, and he would do all these incredible pantomime routines, improvise right on stage. So that's where this comes from, ladies and gentlemen. It comes from deep personal trauma, as it's called. Yes. And you, too, can make a ton of money in enacting that trauma for the public in order to acclimate them to further trauma. Indeed, they're being traumatized by just sitting there for 30 minutes at a time watching Mark and Mindy on television through the all-seeing eye. Well, in this case, I think it was ABC, right? The three networks is like Pepsi, Coke, and Fanta. There's really no choice. And you know where the networks come from. You know how they're connected. I was part of it. I was innocent. I just knew that I was a lonely child who needed affirmation. My mother loved me. I, there was nothing I did that, that um, I mean, she was just delighted by me. She was a Southern lady, genteel, very sociable. Uh, I do have some faint memories of seeing her naked at one of these late night parties with the Ford executives. But other than that, she was just like your mother and, and uh, father. Now, my dad was a very cold person. He'd seen all these atrocities during the war. And uh, as we know, you check out one of Professor Sam Hamamoto's earlier talks about uh, the uh, bombing survey, right? W.H. Auden, he did a whole book. He did a, an epic poem called The Age of Anxiety, which came about through the mass bombing of civilians in Germany, through Central Europe, Ukraine, Russia, Japan, Tokyo, Okinawa, all of it. World War II, Germany, of course. Yes, absolutely. And the homeland, uh, the British Isles. And W.H. Uh, Auden pronounced it the age of anxiety. We've been there for decades and decades, even before Robin McLaurin Williams was born. But this is what I was born into to create, to extend the wartime trauma into the so-called baby boom generation. I was born and bred and groomed in order to carry out that agenda transgenerationally. Finally, when I died in 2014, I was able to gain some perspective on my own life. I was able to catch up on some reading. I'm a highly intelligent individual. I had a high IQ. I was infinitely curious. And, and I, as you know by now, I had a boundless imagination. And I got paid for it. I was rewarded. Except towards the end where I got so confused into myself and the program begin to wear off, the neurological implants begin to take their toll on my brain and my mental functions, where towards the end, I had to call my friends. I talked to the makeup lady on the set. 
of uh, a night at the museum and said, I don't even know if I'm funny anymore. I was was having a crisis, having a meltdown. The Canadian director, that should be a tip off for you, Sean Levy, the Canadian director who was doing the last of the three movies, A Night at the Museum, which are very creepy films if you want to see it. It's part animation and part live action. Does that tell you about where we're going as a film culture? right? Pretty soon there will be no more movie stars. They will just be avatars. These are hybrid movies that the Canadian director, Sean Levy, was hired in order to acclimate the public to this new post-human reality. And I will, Robin Williams was this transitional figure in the in the toss over or the handover from live entertainment, improv, human creativity into the algorithmic reality of Paradise Case, Silicon Valley, Harvard University. In fact, I am the product of what I like to call I, Robin Williams. I'm Robin McLaurin Williams. I'm a product of what I like to call the neuro triangle. Yes. It's kind of like the Bermuda Triangle, right? That's where air, aircraft and boats they go in there and they never come out. Well, I, my parents, my father, the Ford Motor Company executive, relocated my family. My, I was the only kid, of course, but we re- relocated to Tiburon. I went to Redwood High School there. I graduated high school there after going to elite boarding school, by the way. And you know about your elite boarding schools especially in Britain and in America there. You know all about the hazing and the sex-based trauma rituals, the sacred anality that the little boys are initiated to. Now, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to claim, I'm not. at least I'm not going to admit that I was buggered when I was going to the elite boys' school before coming out to uh, Tiburon and Redwood. And I was wearing a, a shirt and tie. Every day. I carried a briefcase to prep school. It was like night and day, ladies and gentlemen, when they took me out, my parents took me out of that repressive environment over to California and Tiburon. That's when I got my first Aloha shirt, my Hawaiian shirt. And I dropped the briefcase and I became who I really am. Right? I moved from, from darkness into light, which was in truth more darkness, but I didn't realize it at the time. So to finish up that thought, you know about the Bermuda Triangle? I... Robin McLaurin Williams calls this the neuro triangle. That is, once your brain goes into that constellation of the University of California, Berkeley, which is right across the bay from where I was living in Tiburon. In fact, I have some faint memories of visiting the the laboratories there just to check it out. Of course, I didn't have the grades to make it into the University of California. I had to go to Claremont Men's College which historically has been related to the intelligence agencies, by the way, just like Pepperdine College, where Barack Hussein Obama was laundered through before he wound up at Columbia. There's a whole network of private, especially liberal arts colleges and public universities where people like me are shunted through in order to be these generational uh, bellwethers, as they're called. That is the goat that wears the bell that leads the whole generation down the primrose path to the slaughterhouse. So that was my function there. But the neuro triangle is the University of California, close to me in Tiburon, across the San Francisco Bay, there's a University of California, San Francisco. It's part of the UC system, but it's graduate only, primarily medical sciences. There are no undergraduates, UC San Francisco. And this is where my dear wife, Susan Schneider Williams, was taking me to get all these CAT scans and looking into my brain, looking deeply into the inner workings and the functions and the, and the, the, the physiology of my not just my brain, but I think they were checking out my soul as well. So that's two prongs. That's two coordinates of the neuro triangle. The third one is down at Stanford University. That's what I call the neuro triangle. Once your brain goes in, that's the last you'll ever see of it. And of course, uh, Susan Schneider uh, Williams uh, took me down there to get checked out by the psychiatrists, the neuroscientists that got Tons and tons of money come from guess where, right? I've been dead since 2014, but I've been watching what's been going on, especially since 2020. The name Anthony Fauci is not new to me. I know all about the National Institutes of Health. 
its institutes, by the way, and that includes a very large division in so-called mental health. And this particular array of institutions are at the cutting edge of the post-human future. What we're seeing now, we're being jerked around by people. Well, not me. I don't watch much television anymore, but every once in a while, I'll check CNN and I'll watch Don Bongino and I'll see Ben Shapiro. I'll see Stu, uh, the auctioneer Peters or whoever else that have been put in place to suck the energy out of the true advances that that and awakenings that have happened amongst the American public, because these people are all pseudo conservatives and pseudo populists, and they've been trying to capitalize on the the advances of independent media that we've seen people like uh, Dave Emery, who uh, is in Silicon Valley, but for some reason has been able to escape the the, cl the, the clutches of the um, of the neuro triangle. So that's the Golden Gate Bridge. Let me continue uh, down memory lane here before I bring it up to the present and tell you about the movie that I was featured in without even being in it. How's that for, I've been dead for, I think uh, it was uh, six years and the movie came out in 2020. I'll get into it in a moment. But first of all, oops, well, wouldn't you know it? I'm sideways. I'm, go I'm going sideways all my life. This is me back in circa 1977. You know, the flower power generation is, uh, is over by that time. San Francisco's getting to settle down. The, all the uh, Project Midnight Climax and Sidney Gottlieb and the CIA and uh, Project Chaos, that had already been done. And, and uh, the intelligence agencies in cooperation with University of California, Sanford University, Harvard, Yale, all the Research One institutions had all the agenda and the, physio the physiology of, of mass mind control, uh, including mass media, of course, networks and film and, and radio. Uh, new media, so-called internet, had not come in, but that was was soon to follow. They had that all dialed in, and that's when I started to make my my fame and fortune in San Francisco. And all the time, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I I was already in my early twenties, and I was still living at my in at home with my mommy and daddy. I had separation issues from them. Sure, I could say, oh, I was poor, and I you know. I had to stay, but it was more than that. I just really couldn't leave the nest because after all, daddy was so rich, he could have cut me a check and I could have lived in an apartment in San Francisco, right? He's, he was loaded. Instead, I had to pretend that I was a pauper. People didn't know that I was that connected into the intelligence community. It was kind of a shock to them and uh, with uh, with the exception of a couple of girlfriends, because I was having lots and lots of sex, right? Especially after I'm getting ahead of myself, especially I went to New York City to Juilliard. I had lots of sex, like semi-public sex all the time. And that is part of the grooming process. I'll get to that in a moment, unless I, it skips my mind, because I have so much to share with you. So this is me in, you, it's a black and white picture, but you already see that I'm rocking the gay suspenders rainbow where did the rainbow iconology first it came through robin williams it came through mork right just like mork introduced to us the idea in the culture about the friendly space brothers who are going to rescue us from the new world order yeah i've been dead now for quite a while but you know, I had a lot of time to read about the Montauk Project and that Australian dude, Five Eyes, Michael Sala, who has got a whole bunch of books on the U.S. Navy's, the secret space program, the Space Force. You got the crypto terrestrials. You got Dreamland with Bob Lazar, right? Project Blue Beam, PsyOps, the threat, Dr. Uh, Jacobs here, uh, David M. Jacobs from uh, Temple University. You got not one, but you got two volumes of William Mills Tompkins called Selected by Extraterrestrials. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, don't stop. You can't stop, right? Exogenesis, Human Hybrids, a book, Operation Blue Light, Project Future, The Cosmic Womb. Oh, here's one by a medical doctor from uh, Yale University Medical School, John E. Mack, MD, Passport to the Cosmos. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, 
I've had such a great vacation reading up and all the literature here. But let me tell you, it's all BS. It's all part of the psyops. And I, Robin Williams, came to Mork and Mindy, and I didn't know at the time, of course, in order to make it a friendly, accessible, nanu nanu experience for humanity. And for good measure, I got to bring in the rainbows on my braces, as they're called in England. We prefer to call them suspenders, right? Because the agenda is the suspension of human life. Oh, here we go. Now we're right side up. We're no longer in uh, fantasy land. And it started to turn south here, right? The National Enquirer, Robin's tortured final minutos. Not Minudo, right? The boy band. Remember the boy bands? Wow. Whoo, whoo. My gosh. The boy band. The boy band scare. Man, that was worse. That was that was terrible. But there was a Latino one. It was called Minudo. But I'm not talking about Minudo. I'm talking about Robin Williams' final Minutos. Okay? Minutos. Robin Williams. Right? Senor Robin Williams. The National Enquirer. And you know the National Enquirer is a CIA organ. Right. It was transformed there to by General Sopopa Jr. Right. His father was was a was an immigrant who all of a sudden, you know, he was like a construction guy who didn't know anything. And all of a sudden he's a a, a brilliant uh, business mind. Sounds kind of like the Jeffrey Epstein story, doesn't it? <laughs> or Leslie Wexner. By the way, Leslie Wexner uh, figures into this because he's a big donor, as you know, to Ohio, Ohio State University. And guess what? Leslie Wexner was interested in as as. as as well as uh, his protege or his front man, man, Jeffrey Epstein, they were into neuroscience. They were into brain hacking. They were into neurohacking. And one of their first proof of concepts persons was Robin Williams. Robin McLaurin Williams was the product of that. How do I know this? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, Robin Williams, read all the biographies. I read all the articles. I had a lot of time since I've been dead to catch up on my reading. Here's the lurid headlines, right? There you go. How he really died, the 9-11 call and the cops probe are racked by years of drug abuse, drug and alcohol abuse. He never recovered from Belushi's overdose. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, I didn't mean to kill her inside the haunted dark side of America's funniest man. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, Robin Williams uh, watched all the classic movies just like you and me. We watched them in reruns on our PJs because we lived lonely lives uh, in front of the the uh, lobotomy box. So it it ended uh, horribly, and uh, you you were around. You saw it, right? They had the news crews, the satellite trucks, and this is at the home that you saw the aerial view of. Over at Paradise K. What a mockery, right? What an ironic mockery of what it's paradise for whom? Right? Certainly not for us, for, certainly for these people who, by the way, as I alluded to at the top of this rant, will be taken away by a massive deluge, right? The mother of all tsunami that will inundate San Francisco Bay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me go into phase two since we're halfway through my stand-up routine, 60 minutes, right? By the way, no drugs were harmed in, in the, um, in the uh, filming of this show right here. I, I assure you I had, have had nothing stronger than uh, a, my daily cup of uh, ground uh, coffee, right? Fresh roasted ground coffee from Pete's, by the way, which is from Berkeley. <laughs> All right, we're going to go into phase two now. You might recognize this is uh, wife number two. Uh, her name is uh, Susan Schneider hyphen Williams. They were married for only three short years, but hey, that's okay. That's all right. There was some talk, some smack talk about the children, the adult children and the ex-wives that she kind of you know, caught him when he was already a celebrity and already made his nut and was kind of on his way down. And, you know, they didn't use the G word gold digger. Uh, but uh, that's heavily implied in all the literature that I've been able to read here in heaven. Yes, I'm, I went to heaven. I'll let you know there is a heaven. There is a God. And you can believe in that. I'm Robin McLaurin Williams will will tell you that that uh, I was there. 
And uh, I'll also tell you that none of my ex-wives are, are, are with me or are going to join me. Anyway, this is the lady who uh, we had a cute meet at the Apple computer store, of course, as I told you about. And whenever her name was uh, mentioned to me by interviewers, it could be Katie Corey, it could be somebody at a local affiliate, right? Because I had to do the interviews, right? Whenever her name was mentioned, my, I would go into a trance state. I would go into an, another dimension entirely. It almost seemed as if, as if her, her word, her name, was a trigger mechanism that put me into this really good place, right, where I wouldn't know that my brain was deteriorating, that the, that the neurological implants were beginning to take over, just like your mRNA, right? Eventually, the cells expand and the the artificial engineered part takes away. It starts to intrude on the organic material. And pretty soon you have what's called Alzheimer's, which never people didn't know what Alzheimer's, not even my parent generation. We they didn't know what Alzheimer's was. None of that. These are all new, newly engineered post-war ailments that uh, the medical slash pharmaceutical companies have a, a solution to, or they're looking for it, right? Or supposedly they're looking for it. In truth, they're trying to, um, and I'm telling you this, I'm Robin Williams. I've been through the process. All right. I've come out the other end. Uh, they're pretending to find a solution to it, but the truth is they want you to be dug further into the system. And they're going to use my memory they're going to use my contribution to American society, world society, culture, film history. They're going to use my memory in order to help bring in through the back door the neurohacking reality that is already in play. All that we're seeing right now is just a run up. It's a smokescreen to a deeper engineering process that's taking place as we speak here ladies and gentlemen. So let me move into the video section. This is uh, me and the missus at, um, during um, happier times when I was still sentient and uh, had my most of my faculties together. Although every once in a while I would uh, start to space out. I was perhaps experiencing some of the early onset of the uh, dementia as it's called sometimes. And again, here is the luxury home that uh, I alluded to earlier. This is the home that my artist wife, she was a painter. And by the way, we lived an independent life. My other wives were always very much interested in my career. They accompanied me on trips. Sometimes they'd even be in the audience and prompt me, right? They were shills, right? Which is done in comedy. And uh, they would uh, support me all the way. But uh, Susan uh, Schneider, she was a painter and was spent most of her time uh, away from Robin Williams. And this is, I'm telling you this because this is one of the points of uh, resentment amongst uh, my heirs, including my three grown children, who I'm happy to report all are doing well. They seem to have their head screwed on straight. I was, since I was a child of privilege myself, I, I was born into incredible privilege and wealth. I wanted to make sure that my children did not grow up with a trust fund mentality. My oldest son, his name's Zach. He went to Columbia University and earned a master's of business administration. And uh, later on, towards when my career was going into uh, an eclipse, he moved out back out here to the Bay Area. He was moving to he moved to Silicon Valley and we got to hang out at the home here and watch the old films like Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove. And all the time, of course, I'm developing new material. So that's Zach. He came back into my life and finally understood me as adult uh, to adult what his father was really about and why he couldn't really be at home <laughs> while he was making a fortune, ironically, to have a happy home. So that's the uh, Paradise K estate. Well, it's not really a estate. It's kind of a modest home for someone who had as much money as he did. Of course, he was supporting three families uh, by this point. And as we move further, this is the final movie. It was part of the Canadian uh, Sean Levy director, because there's an American Sean Levy. He's, he's an author who I invited to the show. I never got a response to him. I knew him back at... Uh, in the UC Irvine days, he, he writes celebrity bios. But there's a Sean Levy, who's a Canadian director. And I say Canada because this is all the part of the Anglo-American PSYOP complex we're talking about. And this is the last uh, 
uh, of three films in this franchise, A Night at the Museum, which I'll have to admit I haven't seen yet, but now I, I need to do my uh, go back because I was I was spaced out. Half of my mind was 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 uh, gone. I couldn't remember my lines. I cried to the director, and uh, as you'll see, uh, Sean Levy in, in interviews, he did his best to try to to get me through this because you know I'm Robin Williams, and there was a lot of money riding on this fran franchise. Not only a lot of money, but a lot of uh, subterranean impact that films like this are having amongst the youth because their minds are being attacked by these uh, neuroengineering signals that are coming through these uh, streams here. So anyway, this is uh, me as Teddy Roosevelt, right? The hero of San Juan Hill, the rough writer, also a uh, genocidal maniac, right? And in, uh, in the Philippines war where hundreds of thousands of Filipino civilians were killed in the process of making the Philippines the first American overseas colony that's the philippines right and that's where the university of california comes in that's where that's why they were founded by the skull and bones they put it out there in the tip of california san francisco bay the presidio right dr um uh, uh the uh, satanic dude michael aquino was at the presidio the presidio was where the troops mustered for the so-called Spanish-American War and the Filipino, uh, uh, the uh, insurrection killed hundreds of thousands. As I mentioned, this is the role that they cast me in to trigger and to keep alive this memory of colonizing the world. And now that the political, the globe, as we see in the back, has been fully integrated geographically, geopolitically, there's this other frontier that needs to be colonized, and that is the human brain and the psyche and the mind and the soul. So there's many layers to this film. The children are not going to get it. If you're into cultural forensics, you will understand still. I'm going to have to revisit this because I couldn't remember my lines, let alone what the movie's about. But I've regained myself. I've become 100% whole again once I passed over into heaven. And here is uh, a timeline of the beginning of the end, October 14th. Uh, as I recall, and again, remember, I'm suffering from what they call Alzheimer's, whatever that is, right? When we were growing up, because I was born in 1951, I we never heard about Alzheimer's. No, none of these diseases, quote unquote, existed, which should tell you that man, maybe they are engineered, right? So from as far as I can remember, this is uh, down at the University of California, San Francisco, where all that the neurological experimentation is taking place. UCSF, yeah. And they're attached, by the way, to a huge psychiatric hospital nearby in San Francisco. And they have all these indigents around there, these so-called homeless people. And you got veterans. Oh, yeah. And don't let me forget. You know, you, you had the groundwork laid by uh, Operation Chaos here. Let me bring myself back up here. Yeah, Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the secret history of the 60s. Tom O'Neill, right? I told you I hit town in the 70s, mid-70s, to, to uh, take partake of the burgeoning stand-up comedy revival scene, right? People like Mort Saul, Lenny Bruce, had made earned their their stripes in the 19. By the way, Mort Saul was a good friend of mine all the way to the bitter end. He was a resident of Tiburon himself. Of course, as you know, uh, Lenny Bruce uh, was persecuted, right? Charged with obscenity, died as a heroin junkie. Well, anyway, this is part of the psyops, and this again, uh, after you know, post mortem, this also this helped me, Robin Williams, uh, figure out that uh, I was a victim of this PSYOP myself. And just as another example of the academic complicity of this, here you have the Unabomber Manifesto written by Theodore Kaczynski. And most people know from the book by Alston Chase, uh, Harvard and the Unabomber, that Kaczynski at age 16 was brought into a juvenile uh, grooming program by a an army, a military psychologist by the name of uh, Dr. Henry Murray. So I'm an extension of this program, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it came to you first uh, 
on happy days, right? A travesty of what the 50s were really like. Because <laughs> really, there, you know, who who even needs the Mandela effect? All we need to do is watch situation comedies to completely rewrite and reinscribe our reality as we lived it, right? So I'm here with uh back with you here today from beyond the grave you know i'm the the ghost uh, of christmas past right i'm the gift that keeps on giving and giving just like the clap right i'm here to tell you that don't believe the hype peter marshall penny marshall all the marshals no one ever deputized them to lord over us they're not sheriffs they're not marshals they're not elective officials they're schlubs the schmucks right you know they, they may think uh, Chinese people are funny just because on Shabbos they'd go and have some Chinese food. Let's have some Chinese. Well, you know what? The Chinese got the last laugh on me because they were the ones who found out that I had all these incredible lesions in my brain. Right. And that's why, you know, Dr. Robert A. Malone is a fraud for saying that he met an mRNA. All you got to do is go to one of these laboratories, UCSF. You see nothing but Chanaman or Chakams as it's sometimes pronounced. So let's uh, move on to the next uh, presentation. Here we go here, ladies and gentlemen. Can you read that? The Adam Sandler Neuroscience Center. And in the corner here, it says UCSF, right? UC San Francisco, as in University of California, not as UC, because they keep hidden. They're crypto, baby, crypto. Uh, I'm just bugging out. It's probably not Adam Sandler, who's movies i could never really understand why it's probably for people who are severely neurologically damaged but i find them uh, as robin williams i find them to be non-funny uh anyway it's called the sandler uh, neurosciences center and this is where they started looking into my brain and, and following up on this decades-long neurological experimentation that they were that they uh, that hey that that I was brought into as a human test subject uh, shortly after I came to Tiburon and went to Redwood High School. Now, it wasn't the, the Sandler Neuroscience Center specifically that worked on him, but it was also the University of California, San Francisco, that treated, quote unquote, treated a predecessor of mine. He was a half generation ahead of me, or perhaps he was, perhaps he was closer to my father's age. And he later became a noted science fiction or speculative fiction writer. And he was fortunate towards the end of his life to see some of his films, uh, some of his books turn into cinema adaptations. And he was quite happy with at least one of them. And uh, you knew that as Blade Runner. And I am talking about none other than Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick lived not too far away from me out in Tiburon, further south in Berkeley. Right. He grew up there. And as a child, his mama, just like my parents, would take him across the bay to the University of California, San Francisco to get his head checked out. Right. Who knows? And then maybe at night they all had an after party at some loft somewhere in San Francisco where all the all the cameras were running. Right. Just like at the comedy shows, just like at the the uh, Hotel Marmont, where I was. I frequented there when I was down in L.A. I had to move out of L.A. Richard Pry, you know, the comedian who lit his face on fire, Free Basin. Richard Pry told me and my wife at the time, she says, you got to get out of here. You're killing yourself. You're, you're taking too much coke. And uh, so I did. I, I went up to Napa the next day with the missus. We flew up on a helicopter and we saw a beautiful ranch up in Napa, which is like going from the fat into the fire because that's all Illuminati wine country land. Which you got the Rothschilds, you got the Mondavi, you got the Shram family, you got the Disney's up in the Napa family. You got Agenda 21 going on, but we bought a 600 acre spread right there. Right on the spot, thanks to the warning of Richard Pratt. It didn't end very well for himself. He also lost his mind. He blew his mind out in a car. He didn't notice that the life had changed. So uh, getting back to L.A. time, right? This is where I was making my, uh, my move. But uh, at the same time, they were uh, trying to entrap me with the film cameras because I was hypersexual. I was getting groomed in Juilliard. Uh, I forgot to mention I was a full ride scholarship and the tuition is not cheap at one of them schools. Let me tell you, I got a full ride scholarship coming out of the College of Marin, a, a dinky community college 
what I, I spent three years there. I mean, most people spend one year, two years of community, but three years? No. I guess I had to, you know, stretch it out so I can go get some treatment over at the Sandler Neurosciences Lab while I was being groomed to become Robin Williams. But out of the College of Marin, and I was still living in mommy's and daddy's house, right? They probably had the, the people, the naked people from Silicon Valley. Uh, by the way, I think uh, I suspect that one of my dad's uh, big bosses over at Ford was Robert McNamara. Robert Strange McNamara, right? Robert S. His middle name was Strange McNamara. He was the secretary of defense. You didn't know that? Yeah, Robert McNamara was my daddy's boss at Ford because he come out of there. Man, uh, Robert McNamara and a bunch of these whiz kids, Harvard whiz kids, were sent to Harvard University to learn operations research, right? Operations science, management science, human relations, because the psychologists, the behavioral science had figured out we got to create a certain type of managerial class in order to run game on the rest of the people. So they got Robert Strange McNamara trained over at, at Harvard, got himself an MBA, and then they sent him over to Detroit City. Right. And then they got Barry Gordy saying the sound of young America with Motown, right, to distract all the peoples. But they got Ford Motor Company engineering the human consciousness and all of the humanity. You see, that was my daddy. That was my pappy, Robert Strange McNamara. And then Robert McNamara got picked out of the Ford Motor Company. And then he was made the secretary of defense of the United States of America. And after he left that, he went over to become the head of the Royal Bank. Yeah, the Royal Bank. Yeah, I got bank. So Robert Strange McNamara, when we was kids, right? I was born in 1951. After all, I'm a child of television. I grew up as a rug rat watching Uncle Rob, uh, Walter Cronkite on the CBS Illuminati Network, right, right out of OSS land. He would tell us all about the Vietnam War that was run by Robert Strange McNamara. And they would put out their every night during dinner, six o'clock promptly, the body count. Yeah, this is how many gooks we killed today. Oh yeah, Robert Strange McNamara. He was producing automobiles on a massive level and he was producing carnage and dead gooks on an industrial scale. Yeah, W.H. Auden, you got nothing on Robert Strange McNamara. This is not the age of anxiety. This is the age of mass atrocity. And now they're going in for the final kill. They're going in for our brains. They're going in for our neurological makeup. They're going in for our soul. Yeah, Grandpa Funk. Oh, yeah, reality. What a concept. Now, new, now, now. All right, let's go on, ladies and gentlemen. We're going into my brain scan. Yeah, coming to my brain. Oh, I'm dying here. Oh, yeah, yeah, panic. Blah, blah. Yeah, this is uh, Robert uh, McLaur. Uh, I'm sorry, Robin McLaurin's brain scan. That'd be me, right? You can see all the little gray matter being taken over by them prions, right? You know, Robert Gajasek, he's another one of them uh, crazed, sexed, uh, perverted uh pedophiles robert uh and he's an uh not coincidentally coincidentally perhaps but uh, uh Gajusek, doctor he's a medical doctor also as a nobel prize laureate he is a pioneer in prion disease do you think he cared what them cannibals over in the trobriand islands uh, that they went crazy by eating them eating each other cannibal and getting the prion no no he wanted to figure out how are you going to weaponize prions and give it to the american population and I'm one of the first examples of how they figured how they were going to be able to do the kuru, which is eating the, the disease that uh, the Trobrian Islander, Melanesian people, uh, these are uh, South South uh, Pacific Islanders, right? They're walking around half naked, right, on the little brown skin boys that Dr. Carlton Gadgetic liked to bring home. Every time he'd bring them in like 20 at a time, all them brown skin Trobrian Islanders. And he was a proud and admitted pedophile. He was even tried. He was arrested and he was convicted and he split, right? So this is all part of the uh, military industrial pedophile complex. And of course, the neuro triangle is all part of it. And there you go. You see, they call it Louis body disease, L-E-W-Y, Louis body disease. Check it out because ladies and gentlemen, I didn't know this because I was 
bedazzled by all the men and women in the white smocks, right? Most of them were Asian, by the way. All the ones who are, are the PR fronts, like Robert Malone, who looks like he's uh, the product of the of the uh, unholy alliance between some of the people that, came, that made it in the on the set of uh, Planet of the Apes. That's Robert Malone. Those are the ones they put out there, but it's it's all the Asian people who are doing the actual work. So anyway, here is my brain. Here's my brain on crack. So here's here's the Asian people that are actually doing the work. Uh, here's one of them. He's, they're looking at uh, Louis body disease. This is where these uh, bodies, uh, Louis bodies, supposedly take over the rest of your healthy uh, function. And, and apparently, according, to, yeah, because there now there's there's an association, right? There's a lobby. There's a group. There's a neuroscientific stock market initiative, right, to pump up the stocks in this area. It's probably going to be the steaming sacklers of you know what family, the farm, big farmer that's going to aggressively go into this is going to fund it, and they're going to use my memory of Robin, Robin McLaurin Williams, my the fond memories of me as Mork, right, the guy with the gay suspenders, Mork and Mindy, the Dead Poets Society, Death to Smoochie, One Hour Photo. All of it. Good morning, Vietnam. I'm going to use my goodwill in order to bring you, us, and I'm warning you, my fellow human beings from the planet Orc, they're, war they're going to bring this to you soon unless you watch closely here and spread this presentation virally, if I may use that term. So here's one of the uh, uh, enemy assets on the uh, computer screen, right? We like our Chinese people, especially on Shabbos, right? There's, you heard about the Shabbos Goy. Well, there's the Shabbos uh, Chinaman who will cook for you on, on Saturday. And, and then Billy Crystal, you can put it on your act, right? right? It, when you're in the Catskills, you know, which I've always, uh, Professor Hamamoto has told me he always wanted to be a uh, Jewish comedian, but uh, I'm, I'm Robin Williams, you know, I'm a Goy. And so I say, you know what? You're not going to make it because your name's uh, Daryl Hamamoto. And so I said, OK, uh, Robin, I, I got I got the idea uh, hereafter. I'm going to be known as Sheki Hamamoto. So uh, I still haven't gotten the uh, calls from uh, the uh, Tonight Show yet, but I'm waiting. Right. I'm the world's oldest golden boy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, where am I getting all this insight about my death and how it's being exploited? Well, I peered into my looking glass from heaven above and I saw this documentary that was that came out in my name in 2020. You can get it for free on the retailer that ate the world, right? There's another example of grooming, Jeff, one-eyed Bezos, Robin's Wish, and it's Robin as in Robin Williams. And there's my, that's where I grew up. That's beautiful Marin County, beautiful country. And of course, only wealthy people can afford to live there, right? The people who are hacking the human race, humanity, and here's my home area, directed by Tyler Norwood, whoever he is. And there's beautiful San Francisco, the city of the gay brotherly love in the background. And then in the foreground, you see the aforementioned Golden Gate Bridge. So this is my uh, turf, so to speak. This is where I got the program. Now, here is where it gets kind of suspicious, right? We know about executive producer. We know about Albert Broccoli, right, who did most of the James Bond films. And you know about... Uh, well, you know, the names, right? Brought to you by so-and-so. But here, you don't really see a lot of producers, executive producers who have advanced degrees, especially medical doctors by the name of Shoshanda Ungerleide, right? Is she related to Klaus Schwab or is she Mossad, um, Israeli? Or I don't know, but her name is Shoshanda Ungerleide and she's a medical doctor and she's one of the executive producers of a film about... This dread disease called Lowy body disease. By, by the way, I forgot to mention me, Robin Williams, I forgot to mention that Dr. Robert Lowy was one of the Jewish Austrian doctors who had to flee Hitler. I think actually it was an exfiltration move, not they weren't, they didn't care. You know, they wanted to bring it over to America so that uh, the OSS can use the technology for brain hacking. They knew that the big battle was going to be the battleground of the mind, not of the the Polish breadbasket or, or Ukraine. It was going to be in the brain, in the mind, the soul of humanity. So they got Shushana Ungerleiter as producer of this film to, to alert us to this problem. But let me finish my thought about Dr. Louis, L-E-W-Y. It turns out he was one of the Austrian Jewish medical doctors that were recruited as part of this paperclip organization. They were, 
Paperclip wasn't just all a bunch of Nazi Aryans. There were tons of Jews that were brought into it as well. He was one of them, and they posted him out at the University of Pennsylvania. Check that out. That is like Nazi Paperclip Central. And that's where he came up with this, oh, there's some foreign bodies in the mind. It's called, let me name it after myself. My name is Louis. Anyway, we're in 2022. Look it up, Dr. Louis, University of Pennsylvania. So we got the producer, Shoshona Ungaleva, and we have another, two of them. Her name is Dr. Amaili. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Miley Sharvat, right? Now, I'm not trying to be xenophobic here, no. You know, we don't have to just keep it in America. That's cool. America's open. It's open. The border is open. I'm not against foreign people, especially if they got something to contribute to American society. So, but I checked her name out, ladies and gentlemen. Me, Robin Williams from the dead. I checked her name out. I looked at it, and guess where she got her PhD? She says, doctor, she wants you to think she's a medical doctor. Not that they're any better. In fact, many times they're worse, right? But she wants you to think she's an MD. She's not. She's a PhD. So guess where she got her PhD from? Yeah, she got her PhD not from UC, not from Stanford. She got it from Palo Alto University, right? Palo. That's where Stanford is in Palo Alto. So they use Palo Alto University so that most people, oh, well, she must be related to Stanford. They don't have anything to do with each other. And you re might remember Palo Alto. Palo Alto University as where uh, Christine Blasey Ford teaches. She's a PhD in psychology. Blasey Ford, she's the one, not that I'm a big fan of Brett Kavanaugh, but she's the one of accusing Brett Kavanaugh when he was going through the nomination process of sexual harassment. So that is uh, Christine Blasey Ford. And as it came out, the place there is a recruiting ground for PhD types, right, from the CIA. And not coincidentally, one of the guys in my department, his name's Dr. Stanley Sue, who was the head of so-called Asian American mental health, which is a total scam because they got one for the colored people here, the Latinos. They got them for all the different food groups and for Asians. But anyway, after he snuck away from UC Davis and holding me down and ratting me out, he went over, guess where? Palo Alto University. Just check him out. His face is right there. Go ahead and sue me, mother, um, because uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's war, okay? It's war. You you started, I'm gonna finish it. And okay, ladies and gentlemen, wrapping up. I'm getting to the top of the hour. This is uh, the monument to Robin Williams, right? Remember the gay suspenders? Well, he's got two tunnels of love going in opposite directions going from uh, San Francisco to uh, Marin County. It's called the Robin Williams Tunnel. Yeah, that's a tunnel, ladies and gentlemen, that I don't want you to go down. I've been down that dark tunnel. I uh, didn't emerge until today. Thank you, Professor Hamamoto, for lending me the use of your body and your mind and your platform, because I'm here as a harbinger of hope to my people, Dr. Ernest Angre, please I join with me in prayer so that we can restore all the freedom and the beauty and autonomy of America, the free, America, the beautiful. We love you, all the people of the world, yellow, black, brown, red, all of you gay, homosexual, bisexual, we are all in love with you. We are all bodies and brothers and sisters in Christ the Lord, because baby, I found it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I owe everything to Richard Pryor to getting myself out of there. And uh, don't don't be thrown off by them them so-called entertainers bitch slapping on themselves on TV, because you know what? They're gonna be put back on the plantation right quick, just like I was. All right, peace out. <laughs>